What should young people do with their lives today? Many things, obviously. But the most daring thing is to create stable communities in which the terrible disease of loneliness can be cured. Kurt Vonnegut, Palm Sunday. This film is part of my personal quest to discover how to better navigate, manage, and understand loneliness by learning how to cultivate a stronger sense of belonging and connection through community. None of us are immune to loneliness, even when surrounded by generally likable people in a crowded room, while in committed and loving relationships, or after acquiring fame and fortune. The following are excerpts from conversations I've had with those in my inner circle who I particularly admire for their ability to cultivate the kind of community I value and who have acted as guides on my journey. My friend Jen has an innate ability to foster community, so much so that I refer to her and those with related interpersonal skills as the center of gravity since she has a stabilizing impact on those around her. Given her aura and training as a counselor, it is particularly validating to hear her opinion on loneliness as a universal experience. Everybody in some way or another seems to be lonely or missing something. It's why we do a lot of the things we do, because we're searching for that community. And people who come to our counseling ministry, a lot of times they don't even go to our church. They've just heard about it from other people, and we serve everybody. But many times, problems arise from them needing more community than their family or friends are able to give them. So in my counseling training, we think about the, the core desires that every person has. And one of those desires is community. And community can mean having a partnership with somebody else. It can mean having relationships with children or with parents. It can mean being part of a larger group of people. It means personal connection. And community in general is something that every human needs. But I wouldn't say that every human needs to have a partnership. Some people are perfectly content just being part of a group of people who cares about them and who they can be themselves with. When I lived in Cuba doing legal research, I was impressed with the glue, metaphorically speaking, that holds Cuban society together during tough times. Here, Michel talks about his compatriot's approach to hardship and how it differs from his own personal experience living in the United States. A strong sense of community here in the United States, but I, I would like to describe those as, as pockets, for example, right? Because I also see a very strong sense of individualism. Like, for example, I work with someone that he talks about how he has lots of guns and lots of ammo and a lot of gold in his home and a lot of food and water because if a hurricane or a natural disaster strikes or or an economic crisis uh, takes place, he wants to be able to protect his family. So that's his mentality, right? But the mentality in Cuba is, is very different and it's, and it's very simple. You know, um, we have nothing, um, whatever we have, we should be able to share it with, with everybody, right, for, for the good of everyone. Zizu is known for his generosity, even though he rarely makes his good deeds known. When living in Minnesota as a student, he regularly offered strangers who would otherwise need to take the bus or walk a ride home. Upon my request, he relates his experience of offering a ride to two senior citizens, a man and a wife, who are waiting for the bus in sub-zero temperatures. Like in my country, it's the normal things to stop for elderly or someone disabled to give him a ride or help him. The couple who I give them a ride, they were uh, 
not just surprised. I think they were like uh, upset that I was from a different culture and I'm the one who stopped by and helped. Like they keep saying this stuff until I dropped them off at their house. They told me some of people who uh, like drove by, they know them. They they were children when they uh, like they were adult. I don't know. Like they know some of the people who in the neighborhood and they drove by them and nobody stopped. Maybe that just coincidence, but I don't know. I gave them my number, said if you need any help. If they think I was trying to get money or get reward, I don't know. I met Garnett when we lived in the Deep South, almost two decades ago. Especially since he is a black man, originally from Jamaica, I've been extremely impressed with his ability to adapt to mainstream America's sense of community or lack thereof. Here, he describes how he learned to not only adapt, but also appreciate and adopt the American way of community response. Growing up in a community in which I was accustomed to public cries for help would be responded to immediately. So if you shouted thief, people would run after the thief. If you shouted help, people would try to run to your assistance. So when I moved to New Orleans and saw people being robbed and somebody would shout thief and someone would run off and nobody would run to their assistance, it shocked me. But again, that gets back to one of my early observations that when I grew up, that people didn't turn to the state as quickly the way I see them turn to the state here. That the logic of Americans was that you running up the thief could bring yourself serious harm. And it was best to call the police and let the police who are trained to handle such things, handle such things. So initially I thought that the Americans were more callous and cold and on feeling and uncaring but over time I've come to say that that's that was an unfair characterization and that it was a different way of thinking of how to address problems and so I'd seen a couple of times since then that that first time that shocked me you know people robbed and I've seen sometimes where people have actually gone after them here in the US time and again you know since the last 20 years I've been here but I've also seen people not do anything in terms of running after the criminal, but immediately running to the victim and trying to console the person and calling the police and trying to help in some way. So I think it's a different way in way they think of problem solving and where danger is concerned. And partially part of it is the relationship to the state in thinking that there are people who are trained for this, there are people who have expertise in dealing with this, and then there are people who know to deal with this in a way that won't bring them harm or if it brings them harm they're they've, they've taken another job in which you know that's part of the risk whereas for a normal citizen untrained to deal with criminals should be running after criminals and endanger themselves and and and, and with americans very much in this and at the end of the day it's only positions it's only money and so there's no need to put yourself in harm's way for money or for material goods while well, talking to even close friends about feeling lonely made me feel vulnerable, the limited English vocabulary available to me made these discussions even more difficult. For example, the word community or the term sense of community did not necessarily convey to everyone an individual feeling of belonging. At the same time, in mainstream American culture in particular, I noticed that the word belong is also ambiguous in that belonging to a professional association, for example, or belonging to a family unit as a brother or sister does not necessarily communicate to others a concept of community. In managing my own loneliness and through engaging in these kinds of conversations with others, I continue to learn new perspectives and ways in which I can cultivate a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of connection.